Mrs. Gandhi is assassinated. Her son takes over. Good evening. Indira Gandhi, ruler of the world's largest democracy, died today, shot down by two of her own bodyguards. They were Sikhs taking revenge for the invasion of their temple in June. And tonight mobs of Hindus have been attacking Sikhs in cities throughout the subcontinent. Within hours of the assassination, the country had a new prime minister, Mrs. Gandhi's son Rajiv. This was how India first heard the news of the murder. We regret to announce the death of the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. She was critically injured this morning at a residence when she was and she was immediately rushed to All India Medical Institute where she succumbed to her injury. Nine hours later, Rajiv Gandhi was being sworn in as Prime Minister, just 39 years old, a former airline pilot thrust into politics when his brother was killed. He's never held a cabinet post. He now has to hold the party and the country together. But already tonight, the tensions between the majority Hindus and the Sikh community are spilling over into violence. Buses have been burned and Sikhs attacked and many have gone into hiding. Mrs. Gandhi had never cared much for her personal safety. Most mornings, she walked from her home to the gardens of the office next door to meet ordinary people and listen to their problems, as she did today. Only yesterday, she'd spoken of dying in the service of her country and said, I would be proud of it. Every drop of my blood will contribute to the growth of this nation. Princess Anne, who's in India, was to have had dinner with Mrs. Gandhi tonight. Now she'll be staying on for the funeral on Saturday. Mrs. Thatcher will be there too. She told MPs the assassination was a savage and treacherous crime. In this extended nine o'clock news, we'll be looking at reactions from around the world and the problems India now faces. First, a report from our correspondent in Delhi, Mark Tully. Indira Gandhi was taken to hospital after she'd been shot by two of her own security guards. They were both reported to be Sikhs. One fired a stern gun at Mrs. Gandhi at point-blank range as she was walking through her garden. The other fired a revolver. One of the guards was killed by commandos, the other was wounded. Anxious crowds quickly gathered outside the hospital. Mrs. Gandhi's daughter-in-law, Menika, the widow of her younger son, Sanjay, came to the hospital with the Prime Minister's grandson. Menika had been estranged from Mrs. Gandhi and had started a political party of her own. The crowds prayed for the life of the woman who'd led them for more than 16 years. But their prayers were not to be answered. Doctors performed an emergency operation and recovered seven bullets. But the injuries were too severe. We tried to do our best to revive her and then immediately after reviving a bit we shifted her to the operation theater on the eighth floor where a prolonged surgery on her abdomen and chest was conducted in spite of our best efforts. We could not save her and she expired at about 2, 2.23 or so. Within eight hours, Mrs. Gandhi's elder son, Rajiv, had been sworn in as her successor. President Zell Singh, who is himself a Sikh, administered the oath of office. And that I will do right to all manner of people. And that I will do right to all manner of people in accordance with the Constitution and the law. In accordance with the Constitution and the law. Without fear or favor. Without fear or favor. Affection or it, ill will. Affection or ill will. Rajiv was chosen by senior members of his mother's party. Their choice came as no surprise. Rajiv Gandhi inherits the Nehru mantle in troubled times. The Punjab is still disturbed after the army action in the Golden Temple. Regional pressures are building up in other states too. Relations with neighboring Pakistan are at a very low ebb, and a general election is due. Rajiv Gandhi faces a truly formidable task. It was only his mother who held the party and the government together. For 19 long years, she dominated Indian politics. Rajiv Gandhi does not have the advantage of experience, but he does have the magic of the Nehru name. 
special security measures have been imposed in the capital, Delhi. Meetings have been banned, and people have been told that they cannot gather in groups of more than four. Angry crowds have already attacked Sikhs and burnt buses. They shouted slogans against the Sikh independence movement. There's been violence in other Indian cities too. India is a land of strong feelings between communities, feelings which could easily take an ugly turn. There are large numbers of Sikhs in the army and in the police. If the Sikh community is alienated, India could face a grave threat to its internal and external security. Rajiv Gandhi's first task is to prevent that. Shortly after taking office, he broadcast to the nation. This is a moment of profound grief. The foremost need now is to maintain our balance. We can and must face this tragic ordeal with fortitude, courage and wisdom. We should remain calm and exercise the maximum restraint. We should not let our emotions get the better of us because passion would cloud judgment. Nothing would hurt the soul of our beloved Indira Gandhi more than the occurrence of violence in any part of our country. Rajiv Gandhi will be the third generation of his family to lead India. His mother's powerful personality came to the office of Prime Minister for the first time 18 years ago. Among India's politicians, she was regarded as a leftist, but she had no time for communism and thought of herself as the head of the world's largest democracy. But there was a ruthless authoritarian streak in her, and the adulation she earned from millions brought her the hatred of many millions more. Her political career reached great heights and great depths, reflecting in the savagery of her battle with political opponents the enormity of India's domestic problems. One of the peaks of her career was her short and victorious war with Pakistan over that country's treatment of the Bengalis, of whom nine million had fled across the border into India. In two weeks, the invading Indian army had occupied the whole of the disputed territory, out of which the new independent state of Bangladesh emerged under India's patronage. But Indira Gandhi then walked into a determined legal assault from her political opponents. She was found guilty of corrupt election practice and banned from holding elected office for six years. Her reply, amid mounting violence, was to declare a state of emergency, suspend parliament, impose censorship and arrest hundreds of leaders of opposition parties as well as some dissidents in her own. Still protesting her commitment to democracy, she tightened her grip on the country, postponing promised elections and extending the state of emergency as her son Sanjay's programme of sterilisation and slum clearance led to still more violence. Then, with misplaced confidence, she called an election and lost it. Once again, she was accused of corruption and subverting democracy. But even as she defied her accusers, refusing to cooperate with a commission of inquiry, her return to power was underway, and by 1980 she was back again as Prime Minister. But the extremes of Indian politics did not deprive Mrs Gandhi of the reputation of a wise, skillful and courageous leader. And despite the excesses of her office, she maintained a respectful and workmanlike relationship with many other nations. Nonetheless, the crisis that was to be her last was born once again in the labyrinths of India's religious and ethnic hatreds. The Golden Temple of Amritsar, the holy shrine of India's Sikhs, was occupied by hundreds of armed Sikh extremists demanding an independent Sikh nation in the Punjab. Mrs Gandhi sent in the troops, and despite initial attempts to minimise their assault on such a holy place, their operation became a massacre and the temple was badly damaged. For India's 14 million Sikhs and many others outside the country, it was an act for which there could be no forgiveness and warnings of Mrs Gandhi's death came thick and fast. That anybody who has done any sacrilege to this holy place of the Sikhs, he was never allowed to live. And I am afraid very soon you will see that somebody, somewhere, will kill, the, kill Mrs Gandhi, her whole family. But Mrs Gandhi could only accept philosophically the possibility of assassination, as she did in this interview only a few weeks ago. Well, I've lived with danger all my life, and I think I've had a pretty full life, and uh, it makes no difference whether you die in bed or you die standing up. 